Erica, are you able to see and hear us? I am able to see and hear you, yes. Okay, super, thank you. How are you today? I'm good, how are you? Good, thanks. We'll just be a couple minutes before we start the meeting. Okay. So I believe um, Carl from Saywell Contracting is attending in person. Um, so we'll just give him a few more minutes to arrive. Okay. Um, while we're waiting for him, just a couple um, housekeeping items. I just wanted to remind the panel members that we do have another meeting in here at 1 p.m. So um, we do have a firm, a firm end time of the meeting today, unfortunately. Um, and just a reminder as well, because we are on Zoom, if you can make sure you try to remember to turn your microphones on and off when you're speaking, that really helps for the recording.
Erica, Carl is still absent from the meeting. Would you like us to get started or would you like us to give him a few more minutes? Here, let me just give him a quick call. I'll turn off my my um, my microphone here. I'll give him a call. And then if I don't get him, then I'll just get started. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. So while we're um, waiting for Erica to join us, I guess one of the items um, that we should start before we do the get into the agenda is that we need to vote on a new chair for the advisory design panel. Um, previously, we had Glenn Hill as the chair of the meeting. So um, if you wanted to recommend someone or, or vote on that. Yeah, I'm happy to continue if that's what everybody wants. A little lower, a little closer. Yeah, I'm happy to continue if, if everybody is in favor of that, but uh, I'm also fine with anybody else stepping in, so. I think you have the chair. <laughs> All right, Erica, were you able to get in touch with Carl? I was, he had the time mixed up and he thought it was at one o'clock and not at 10. So he's just, I sent him the link to the Zoom so he can just join, he can quickly introduce the project and then I can dive into design with you guys. Okay, so And there good. he is. Okay. Well, Tony, I'll pass it over to you to formally start the meeting. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, as, uh, as Sarah pointed out, we'll have to be pretty succinct with our comments today with three projects to try and get through in three hours. So just a, a little heads up there. Um, could somebody move that the, uh, the minutes of our previous meeting uh, be accepted? Thank you. Seconded. Kind of narrows it down, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, we are uh, taking a second look at 103 and 113 Jensen Avenue. Uh, we made some recommendations at a previous meeting, and uh, I guess at this point we'll, uh, we'll hand it over to the representatives for that project to talk to us. And uh, perhaps you could, uh, <clears throat> as part of your, uh, your discussion, uh, address some of the points that, uh, that were made in the last meeting and how you've taken care of them. Hi, good morning. Uh, sorry for being late, guys. I didn't get a Zoom meeting. I was hoping to be there in person, um, but Erica sent or forwarded the Zoom. So thanks, Erica. Um, I'm here on behalf of the owner, and I, I wanted to introduce Erica from Lola Architect. Um, she wasn't able to make it last ADP, um, and I know that uh, that was unfortunate just with her being in Calgary. Um, it was tough to get a flight. Uh, so I appreciate you being open to this Zoom and electronic um, so that she can kind of go through the design and the changes that have occurred. I, I do want to um, kind of go through our reasoning of why we went to council direct uh, after the last ADP. And I, I tried to send an email to council as well of why we decided to do that. Um, it comes down to a time thing. Um, we, we heard your comments from the first ADP and I appreciate the comments. And I believe that we tried to take those comments into consideration through to the design and design changes. But going back to the ADP um, and then going back into the council and, and it, it really does come down to time. We submitted this project back in September. And here we are in February still talking about it. And my concern is the housing just continues to become a crisis. I know recent, uh, even just recent comments from David Eby talking about uh, the housing crisis and it being an issue and how time is not on our side. 
with jurisdictions. It's, it's concerning. So that was our thought process was let's try and fast track this and hopefully we can get some support from council. With that in mind, that's, that's what I'd like to pass now off to Erica and she can kind of tell you the changes of the design. We, we hope that the project that we are proposing, I know uh, is a bit of a problem with the density and 29 units. I thought with the variance of the, the parking laneway was a, a small variance to ask, reducing that 0.5 meters. And that we proved we could get 29 parking stalls on the site, which supports 29 units. Uh, I understand the commercial and the parking for that is a concern, um, but there is parking on the road and there's provisions in the OCP as well as in the bylaw that state we can provide cash in lieu for parking. So we went through the design and the development with that in mind. Anyways, um, I'll move it on to Erica. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. And again, I'm sorry for being late. All right, is it okay if I share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. So I have two, two pieces here. First, I, again, I just, um, to reiterate what Carl has kind of already spoken about. I apologize for not being at the first ADP. It was a very, very short time period in which I was kind of notified that we would be at ADP. And it was kind of like, I, I couldn't get a flight, but also it didn't feel with like Omicron cases rising in Calgary. It didn't feel like a prudent decision to get on a flight out to the island at that time. My mom does live in Comox and she was like, I don't wanna see you. Um, so I, if I could have attended virtually, I would have, but I wasn't given the option at the time. So again, I apologize that I wasn't there at the first meeting um, and I am here now to answer any of your questions, but I do wanna start with just a summary. So obviously there was the ADP meeting on December 16th and then there was a subsequent council meeting on the 7th. So I just want to go through um, what we heard and the changes that we've made, because what you're going to see today is the changes that we've made even post the council meeting. Now, I do need to point out the majority of the concerns were really around parking and density. And that is the one where we do want to point out that we actually are meeting the bylaw requirements for both of those items. Um, so that's we're not asking for any variances or relaxations for overall density and for parking. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as I go through. Um, so again, this was based on the ADP meeting on December 16th. There was a comment that we should respond more to the pedestrian traffic along the corner. And so at the time of council, we had actually pulled back the corner of the building even more to increase that site triangle it's it was not yet at the six meters but we had pulled it back more um the rationale behind that is in most jurisdictions that kind of corner visibility triangle um is is measured to the edge of curb and not actually to the edge of lot but we understand that's not the way that you measure it um concerns about the zero lot property interface along the commercial base I'll talk about this more when we get to the council comments, but we had actually before council pulled it back in some places, but we did keep the zero lot line um, at that time. There, were, there was a feeling that the residential entrance along Craig Street didn't have enough presence. So when we did go to council, we did improve that. You'll see that in what you're going to see today. Um, and then the mobility scooter parking, we totally agreed with that, that it was maybe not in the in the correct place. So that was moved um, for the council meeting. And then we'll show you that again today. Um, comments about the white cladding and the, that the color palette should reflect the official community plan guidelines. So again, that was updated for the council meeting and we'll show you that today. Um, so this one here, the building is higher than what the bylaw allows. Um, so the bylaw does have a height restriction, but then it also has an exemption, which we're going to go through today. Um, we are still proposing a four-story 
uh, development. Um, but again, below the allowable FAR for the site, we did look through some options where we said, well, okay, if we stick to three stories, but then we increase the size of the building, um, what would that do? And so if we actually just kind of built a box that was to that three stories and had the FAR of two, it actually, that felt overbuilt for the site because we, we can accommodate that with underground parking, but it really didn't feel appropriate for the site when we were drawing that. And we can talk you, we can walk you through what we've done to date. Um, we understood you guys were not a fan of the mural. Some people are and some people aren't. And we were glad to replace that with a green wall. And you'll see that on the drawings. Um, and then again, it just felt like there was too much separation between the commercial design and the residential design. And there should be more integration between the materials kind of at that horizontal line. So we had modified that for council and we'll, we'll walk you through that today. And then a sloped roof may be a better choice. So we did actually incorporate some sloped roof elements um, within the, the pear pit design and we'll walk you through that. So again, those were the, the items that were addressed when we had updated the package for council on February 7th. Following the February 7th council meeting, um, we heard again uh, a lot of the 1.5 meter setback for landscaping along the property line. Um, we talked a lot about this internally and, and we have actually modified the design to allow for that 1.5 meter landscaping strip and I'll, I'll walk through that. There was a bit of a debate as to whether we should do it on both Craig Street and Jensen. Um, in the end, we, we have done it on both, although it doesn't necessarily align with, with what's happening along Craig Street right now. Um, again, the six meter site triangle, I'd like to talk about that with you guys in a little bit more detail, but we'll, we'll go through that. Um, again, comments that there's not enough parking to accommodate the needs of the commercial spaces. The reality is that in accordance with the bylaw, we are, the cash in lieu is an acceptable solution. And that, that is what we're providing for at this time. Um, and then the current parking configuration doesn't meet the bylaw to allow for the 7.5 meter dry aisle, because we have dropped that dry aisle pipes from 7.5 meters to seven. I'll talk about that. We are still asking for that variance and we'll talk about that as we go through the design package. Um, and then again, still concerns about the building height. So we have actually dropped one of the units on the upper level where the building height was the greatest just due to the, the slope of the site. Um, and we'll walk through that with you as well. So that's just kind of a summary of the what we've heard and what was modified. So I'll get into the presentation, keeping time in mind. Um, so, you know, Craig Street, Jensen Avenue, we all know the, the project site at this time. Um, so again, walking through, this is the site plan. So what we have here along the lane is the access into the parking. Again, the, the 5.8 meter typical stalls. Um, this parking here is all residential in nature with an access into the residential kind of lobby elevator that will take you up to the upper levels. I'll just kind of go to the next sheet page because it shows it a little larger. Um, along, you'll see along both Jensen Avenue and Craig Street, we have pulled in to allow for that 1.5 meter landscaping strip. And then where we are actually at kind of an entrance feature into either retail or commercial or at the bike storage or at the residential entrance. We haven't put landscaping in that, but instead furnishings just to allow for kind of people to congregate in those spaces um, and move throughout the building. Now, loading stall here on the, the north, um, again, that, that will be for waste recycling, but also for people kind of moving in, moving out. Um, got that the first retail unit on the base here and then we've moved that scooter storage to be directly off of the residential access and lobby and so this actually goes straight through so residences will have that access from the parking in the rear directly into the lobby and elevator they also have access straight off the street if somebody is going to go um, out into the community the reality is this is somewhat of a walkable community i know that 
Parksville as a whole is maybe not the most walkable, but this area you could actually get to quite a few um, services and amenities through walking. So we, we don't want people to have to walk through the parking lot to be able to do that, like just head straight out onto the street and, and head out. We do have, um, just to accommodate the units above, we've got an overhang on the second level and it, there is a column within this six meter site triangle, um, which we can talk about in a little more detail as we get to the 3D renderings. Um, and again, so a larger or possibly smaller retail bay along this face. Um, again, the idea of benches and, and landscaping kind of more planters as opposed to landscaping beds um, to enter those retail units. We still have the bike storage on the side here and then some bike parking for, res for visitors as opposed to residents. Um, so this is kind of what that streetscape now looks like. We have maintained um, the balconies and this strip extending out over um, that 1.5 meter space. It doesn't go all the way out the full 1.5 meters, but it does allow for a bit of a covered entry um, for anybody going into the, the retail units. And if you're kind of at that place where you've got an entry into a retail commercial space if it is raining or you're waiting for someone you you do have some cover um, we did feel it was important to maintain that um, but in order to achieve that in a nice way we do have this column coming down it's a bit of a trade-off um, you know having that that greater kind of pedestrian turn active court like uh, corridor to kind of walk through here it, it, it does as you'll see in the plan greatly open it up for people that are kind of turning walking through this space and in terms of an actual site triangle for somebody driving or making that decision it is outside of the what the ministry of transportation calls that kind of corner visibility decision triangle on whether or not to go so it doesn't impact the view in that sense of when you're driving but it does open the space up more for for pedestrians that are walking through and then you'll see here the uh the sloped roof providing kind of canopy over these balconies um and and just a little more variation to the building you can see how on the corners oh it shows it better in some of the other views just tying together um the upper and lower materials but this is actually more of a beige color, which will, it shows up better in the materials palette than it does in rendering. So it's always hard in a rendering to get the color exact. Um, this is the corner here. So in terms of how the site slopes, because there's a little over two meters from front to back. So what we have done is actually, um, because the way the building height is measured, it's from that kind of average point. But we did take the, the, the point that it, it was the building was getting quite tall at this at this corner where the, the site does slope down. So what we've done is actually taken out that top unit and made it a rooftop amenities space for the, the residents in the building. And then along this corner, just to soften where we do have the waste in the mechanical and electrical in those spaces that are just a little less um, appealing, we, we had the green wall along here and then pulling those materials down to provide a bit of a break and then heading into that retail space where, again, this would be new plantings. So they're a little small in this rendering, but you can see, you know, those those can grow up into kind of bush bushes. There's not enough um, space in that 1.2 meters to really allow for trees, but definitely some shrubberies or hydrangeas or something like that could really soften that, that scape along the side. What you're seeing here is that's that residential entrance and then you can really see that kind of open space for pedestrians to see and move through there as they navigate the corner. Um, just a typical, this is a, the second floor. Um, again, you'll see that, I mean, mostly one bedrooms, we've got four two bedroom units and a one and a half, like so a one bed plus den on the corner here with generous um, outdoor balconies. And then when you get to the, so that's the kind of second and third. And when you get up to that fourth floor, this becoming kind of that outdoor amenity space. Um, so again, here, this is the, just showing the other corners. You can see those materials kind of coming down um, where this exit stair is here. And then it kind of separates off that 
that bicycle room and then those doors would be frosted to allow for privacy but we really still wanted to maintain that kind of street face um language of the building that was that's going along this side and then what you can't quite see in behind this street tree here is that we actually did wrap the the green wall around this corner similar to what we have on the other side so it kind of bookends the two ends of the development from the back you can really get a sense of that slope the parking in this area loading zone here you can see how that kind of pulls down to provide this rooftop amenity in the corner um and then moving through like i said you can get a much better like sense of that that more of a beige color for the siding um and then we've got the the wood look um metal siding again just due to maintenance over time but we have picked one that we we really feel does have that look and feel of real wood but allows for that maintenance free um cladding for the building and then we've got the hardy board and the board and batten for the majority of the upper the dark brick down below and then just some accents of um, the dark bronze anodized aluminum some charcoal um, accent pieces again here you'll see just the, the elevation so what you're really seeing this this dashed red line along here is that average height at which the the average grade on the site that the, the height is measured from. And well, that's where we've kind of pulled down this corner to allow for kind of a rooftop amenity space for residents. And it'll be a great spot because you can actually, from that corner, you have the best view of the ocean. Um, again, the backside, very much like the renders. Um, and then you'll see here using this kind of uh, sloped roof parapet system to hide rooftop mechanical to hide um, the elevator overrun so that you won't see any of that from the street and you won't also see what is like just obvious screening of mechanical equipment we really want that to be hidden and not to be a key component of the project so i mean i think the big ones that we have mentioned so in terms of the bylaw requirement we are allowed a, a floor area ratio of two we're at 1.65 right now um, the max height of 11 meters right now we're at 15.5 um, and then this dry aisle of 7.5 meters in between so what we're asking for is a seven meter um, so if we look here at that overall building height so this line here is that allowable 11 meters from the average grade and then we're going up at to this 15.5 meters for the remainder of the building. Um, and that's really based on your streetscape too, uh, from your bylaw and OCP, which really does allow for a fourth floor is considered where community benefit is provided. And where we really see the community benefit in this project and why actually for us, this project is so important is it's not it's not condos for sale, it is rental. And rental is so hard to find right now, especially a quality rental space um, that's built you know, with aging populations in mind in the sense that we've got larger living spaces that will allow for you know, larger turning radiuses of wheelchairs if required, um, you know, the use of walkers throughout the space, incorporating uh, low threshold showers within all of the ensuite bathrooms so that, you know, people can age in place in these spot these spaces and, and while I know that there's there's a big push for you know owning 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 when the average price of a unit on the island is is up in the, you know, 800 to a mil 800,000 to a million dollars that ability to rent is very, um, I think it's very important and it really opens up opportunities to be in the central core close to the ocean you know walkable distance to your amazing park space and it it really opens that up to people which is why we've got this extra floor so we can get those extra units and really you know we can provide parking for 29 vehicles therefore we've provided 29 units on the site um going through and again this is that that set that um variants that we're asking just for the the 7.0 meter drive aisle um this is very much in line um 
with what most jurisdictions are doing. So the overall dimension is really what you wanna be looking at. So it's this like 5.8 meters for um, the depth of the stall. And then you have your aisle between, and then you have your depth of the stall. So the overall, what we're proposing here is 18.6 meters. Um, for comparison in Victoria, this is the bylaw requirement is 17.2 meters. In Nanaimo, it's 18.3 meters. And in Calgary, where the majority of people drive an F-150, it's, uh, it's 18 meters. So what we're providing here is 18.6, which is still very easy to maneuver. And you need to keep in mind that people that are parking here are the residents. So they'll be familiar with the parking lot and how it works and maneuvering it. It's, it's not people that are kind of coming once in a while and zipping in and out. This is intended for the residents of the space. Um, I should also point out that just the, it, it is a variance um, for that site triangle because of that, that column um, on the corner for that six meters. But you do still have, as you can see from this, quite a good sight line. It's just that the column does interrupt that. Um, okay, I, th I believe I've covered everything and we still have 30 minutes if you're trying to give an hour to each of the three projects. Um, so yeah, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Erica, um, when you took the uh, the unit off the end, which I, I like, you know, the fact that you've got the rooftop garden, um, and yet I believe you have the same number of units you had the first time around. How did you accommodate that? So we had, um, we were, our intention was to um, drop one, one of the units on the second floor wouldn't be a unit. We were actually just going to convert that into storage um, to maintain 29 units. Um, and so instead of doing that, we've dropped the two bedroom unit on the corner of the fourth floor. So there won't be one unit that's dedicated as storage anymore. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Questions? I noticed that some changes have been made since the last submission. And while there are some improvements, some major challenges still remain. First, let's deal with the variances. The, the increase in the maximum building height. At the ADP, we are governed by the OCP and the building bylaw. And until such time that the city revises the OCP and the building bylaw, those are the rules that we follow. In my experience, variances have been sought and granted in order to overcome minor infractions of the letter of the law, not for wholesale rewriting of the OCP and building bylaw to suit the needs of the applicant. I think that it would take an exceptional circumstance for us to recommend to council what you are proposing. Most of the problems related to this submission stem from the pro proposed additional floor, which is actually in contravention of streetscape two, which states that although three stories are permitted by zoning for some properties, a fourth floor may be considered where a community benefit is provided. And I don't think that trying to cure the housing shortage is the, the community benefit that was in mind here. So it's not an automatic approval for four stories. There needs to be a valid reason. Although densification is inevitable in the downtown, this is not Vancouver or Richmond. By virtue of that extra floor, the level of densification for this site is excessive and the way it is handled negatively impacts setbacks, parking, dry aisles and landscaping, which are the subjects of the other two variances that you are looking for. To relax the, the second one was you relax the minimum maneuvering aisle width so the building bylaw, like the building code itself, is a minimum standard to begin with. To reduce those minimum standards even further, I think is irresponsible and short-sighted. Instead of making your building according to the rules, you wanna make the rules according to your building. There's very little on-street parking and there are no parking spaces dedicated to the commercial component. 
There is one loading bay, but it is accessed from the street rather than the lane. Lanes were invented to service buildings without gumming up the main thoroughfares. It would make more sense and work better if the loading bay was serviced from the lane. Again, I ask, where does a cab or an ambulance or the FedEx truck stop? They can't stop on Craig, it's too narrow. So they would be more than likely to use the parking lot, which they would block up and then have to back out to the lane. This is bad planning and it all comes back to trying to stuff too much on the site. A better drive aisle would be a drive through aisle rather than a dead end aisle. This means that something has to give. If there was less parking, all the drive aisles and setbacks could be met. To relax, the next one was to relax the minimum distance between parking space and property line abutting a public highway or lane. And what you're really asking for is a relaxation of the landscaping requirements as well. And also you conveniently don't mention that the landscape setback on the east property line has been reduced to half the required size in order to accommodate the reduced drive aisle width. There are some positives, the, the sloped roofs, uh, that's an improvement, better definition of the entrance to the apartments, improved site triangle, scooter storage of the lobby, provision of planters at street level makes a big difference to the facade. And I assume that means the elimination of the hanging gardens on the second floor. And there's a rather optimistic depiction of tables and chairs on the southwest corner, which is the steepest piece of sidewalk. Then we get to uh, section 12 of water, energy and conservation, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. The, the only thing you've done for that is the stormwater retention on the site. Are there plugins for electric vehicles? Don't know. So you have not really addressed all the concerns that we had in your first presentation. And I don't think that is it's possible unless you get rid of the fourth floor or make some very serious modifications to it because that has a knock on effect on the rest of the site. So I am actually opposed to all the variances that you are seeking. Just want to note, Ivan, that was meant for questions rather than your commentary, but I'll accept that as your commentary uh, for the later part of the meeting. I think that this was just deliberate questions for the, uh, for the architect. So if we can continue with questions and then we'll do commentary afterwards. Do you mind if I make a comment, Tony? Um, I just wanted to clarify that for this application, they've actually also applied for a development variance permit application. So through that, we can consider um, amending or varying the height requirements to allow for a taller building, providing that they're not exceeding their density under the zone. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that comment. So if I say it, they may not be exceeding the density, but uh, they need these other variances in order to make everything else work and it's not working. So in principle, if they make a really good case for and uh, have a really good design for a fourth floor or for that density or however they try and work it out, that's a different story, but this does not work the way it is. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I also think that um, Sarah's point here is that we won't be making those decisions on zoning variances. We can give an opinion, but uh, that'll be outside of our scope for uh, ADP. Um, so I'll move to Bob. Do you have questions on the presentation? No, I have no questions. Thank okay. you. Since we've um, kind of got into the commentary section here, Bob, maybe we could just get your overview of the, the project next. Uh, well, I'm still very concerned on the height variance. Um, and I was trying to find out how many recently of the uh, requests the city has had uh, are requesting a significant height variance. And it seems like there were three or four. And uh, it may be uh, appropriate for the city and the planning department to totally review the, that height variance had the height bylaw. It, given everyone's moving towards more density, 
to uh, help with infrastructure and and the general uh, accommodation problems. It, I feel that that's worth looking at. I, how old was this bylaw? Twenty years. Um, the zoning bylaw, I believe, was from nineteen ninety two. Perhaps time for a review. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Um, I'll just uh, sort of go next if that's okay. So um, my feeling is, is that um, to a large degree, they have addressed our aesthetic considerations with what they have submitted. Um, I see a number of things that uh, we asked for and they've been responded to. Um, Again, I'm kind of concerned about the density, but I've had time to think about this since the last meeting and also I've kind of thought about buildings I've designed over a you know, 45 year period. And it takes a lot, a lot of uh, thinking back to when I last did a three story building and the, the simple economics of residential construction and the cost of land underneath it um, kind of leads us into to four story buildings, which uh, if you look around town, that's pretty much the norm. Um, and uh, it appears that there is an avenue for this applicant to, to uh, apply for this extra story. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, that, that's something that we're not gonna decide, but uh, I'm happy for everyone to, uh, to comment. Uh, I'm, I'm quite pleased that the rooftop garden went on because that did reduce a significant height at the uh, corner of the building. Uh, the green wall was proposed, the additional landscaping and, and seating areas. Um, there are, uh, this is a very small site, so I, I actually appreciate some of the challenges that they've gone through. Um, so uh, again, I do, uh, I do appreciate your response to some of the things we asked for aesthetically. Um, I see quite a few of them on here. Um, one question would, would be the, the balcony railings on this building. Um, I guess uh, if one to look, were to look at the norm these days, uh, most of them are glass and aluminum, and this appears to be kind of a wrought iron or a spindled kind of balcony rail. And Erica, could you comment on that for us? Yeah, we, I'm, it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's either like an aluminum, it's likely an aluminum picket. And I know that the majority right now are glass and aluminum. Uh, my concern with that is always just that they often just look dirty. Um, and, and so we tend to try to lean away from the glass and aluminum because they do have that, like, they kind of get that brown, dingy, dirty look over time, especially as it rains. And then if, if any, uh, dust or dirt hits that when it's wet, like it just kind of cakes on. Um, so in terms of, of maintenance over time, the spindle, yeah, it, and it's also just I don't know, in the design world right now, people are kind of, you know, as things do, things go in and out of fashion. It's like, are your jeans skinny or are they wide? Um, right now, pickets are kind of in style. I mean, we're not opposed to the glass, but I we do have that concern with just the the dinginess that they, the, the look that they get over time. They look, <clears throat> pardon me, they look quite transparent on your elevations. Is that, uh, is that a fair assumption? I know there's restrictions for the spacing of those pickets according to the building code, so. Yeah, they're actually drawn to scale um, in this rendering. So the size of a picket with a four inch gap, 100 millimeter gap in between, um, they're actually drawn to scale in this so that it's fairly accurate, yeah. Okay. Um, as I say, I have a hard time telling the proponent to knock a story off this building, even though it would probably be a kind of a heartfelt decision to have a lower rise building here. Um, uh, as my personal view is, uh, I can't see how somebody would necessarily build this project if it doesn't fly economically. Um, so I'm not sure we're in agreement on that one. Um, but if it's okay, I'll pass along to, to Marilyn for some comments. Uh, always appreciate her input. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask Erica, um, you know, it was about the balconies actually being opaque. I was just, um, I guess it was what Tony just asked about and, and whether or not how, how one would hide some of the belongings and paraphernalia that uh, residents might, 
might have being such a visible corner. So I just wondered, you know, if there's not going to be much storage, I, I guess you've lost a storage unit for them. So can you maybe uh, help me out as to how you would address that? I, I think that would be addressed in the management rules for the building. I mean, it is a rental building. Um, so there will be guidelines of what people are allowed to put on those patios, like on their balconies. Um, and from what I understand, they're going to be fairly involved and, and we'll kind of call people out on if it becomes a storage area, because it shouldn't. Um, and then again, like I said, that the units are actually quite generously sized. And so we're, we'll be designing in storage within the unit. Um, so people can have some of that stuff there. And then in terms of bicycles or scooters, those, there is storage space for those um, downstairs. So it would just be other things that you, that you would want to be storing in there. So we'll be, we'll be working in a, some storage space within the units that you typically wouldn't see. Thanks, Erica. The other question I had is you've got a lot of scooter space. So are you going to have an age limit on this building or is how is it planned for many seniors I I believe that's how you uh yeah in in speaking to the the client group of developers they they are anticipating um that there will be um a lot of seniors looking at this building to rent so yeah we do have this scooter storage um at Maine and I mean it can <laughs> Right now we're we're allowing for that, and I think it'll be like as in an as needed basis because you can just as easily put bikes in there or something else. Um, but we we have gone through and, and designed decisions that are being made is to ensure that, um, like I said, one of the two bathrooms has the ability for a, a low threshold shower with the bench in it. Um, the space between the island and the kitchen cabinets is is a little wider to allow for walkers, to allow for that kind of spin around, a little bit of aging in place, um, just thinking through that um, as we think through the design. Thanks for that. Erica, the other, um, no, no electric car charging space? Or, or there work, likely or I... will be. Um, I can't even think of a project where we're not putting it in now. I just don't have a we haven't decided on the amount yet. And this is the argument every project is going into right now is like, how many? <laughs> and, and should it be roughed in for all? Should it be just a percentage? Um, we're still having those conversations um, with the client group right now. And we should have that, that answer, I would think, for the council meeting. But um, I, I can't imagine there won't be any. Oh, that's wonderful. The other... One other observation um, on the in the development permit area that we talk about West Coast elements. Mm -hmm. Just um, are there any wood elements, not just wood look, but any other wood elements themselves? Um, on on this one, no. It's mostly just the uh, the cladding that would be the wood. I mean, we could look at this column in the corner here, and there's one on the other end. But in in this design. Um, the focus really is on the, on the, so all of the soffits um, would be wood as well. So when you look at each balcony, the underside of each balcony being the wood, and then you'd have the wood, um, the siding in the, in the pieces that are shown. Thanks, Erica. Yep. Just one more question, Erica. Um, it was raised that uh, as far as, you know, any green initiatives or environmental uh, sort of contributions with this building, there seems to be um, very little involved. Was any thought given to uh, other things you could do with this building, if it, whether it be rough in or actual, um, you know, energy saving elements to, uh, you know, to give us some sort of feel that uh, that green design was thought of here? The, the biggest thing you can do for green design is a robust building envelope. Um, which isn't something that's going to show up at a development permit stage, that's going to show up at a building permit stage. Um, but yeah, it's that increased um, insulation in the building envelope, you know, again, increased performance on windows. Um, those are the biggest things you can really do. I mean, in terms of roughing, really the only thing you'd be roughing in for is solar panels or vehicle charging. I can't imagine we're not doing vehicle charging. Um, and whether or not that decision is made to include solar panels, they would be fully hidden behind that 
that sloped pear pit we have right now. Um, and that's an easy thing to add in later. Um, again, the other things that you don't see and so wouldn't be in a development permit level is just how the, the building is heated. So whether it, it's heat pumps um, or something else, I mean, obviously I, I can't think of a project right now that wouldn't have uh, heat recovery ventilation involved. So those are, you know, your uh, low water fixtures, high efficient appliances, that's really where you're seeing those green initiatives. Um, you know, and I hate to point it out, but densification in and of itself is, is green and having more people and in increasing that density in a location. Um, I know that we, we have heard comments that this is not a walkable community, but I mean, I've, I've been to the community a lot and I would argue that this is actually a walkable site. So if somebody did live here and did want to walk, I mean, that that's increasing your environment, like that's decreasing your environmental footprint right there. Um, and so I guess if you're looking for something that's like a, a billboard on the building that says this is green and therefore, you know, uh, solar panels or something like that, yet yeah, we, we can easily accommodate those on the roof. And in terms of vehicle charging, I think it, it, it's a requirement. It, it's not even about having a green initiative at this point, but it, it's what people, especially on the island, want. I mean, the number of electric vehicles on the island is, is just continuing to grow. And the debate just comes down to, well, how many should we accommodate? And running that metric to try to figure out what is the right amount. Um, you know, adding to that green, light, all of the lighting in the building will be LED. But that, again, it's not something that's showing up at the development permit stage. And does that help? I think so. And I think, I guess what you're, you're saying is with the robust building envelope, you're looking at lower energy consumption and costs for the building as uh, one of your calling cards then. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I guess we need to prepare some, some recommendations again for this building. And, uh, I think we have from Ivan right now um, a pretty much uh, comprehensive that you don't uh, support what we have here. Uh, from Bob, I have heard that you really think we should look at the, uh, the uh, Parksville guidelines for this height because it may be out of date. Um, that's the one thing I heard from you. Yeah, I, I'm I'm comfortable with this this height variance, but I think it's outside the uh, panel's jurisdiction and rules to approve it. I agree with you. Like I'm, you know, I, we've made initial comments on, on the uh, variances that were requested. They're not significantly changed and, uh, and that's not our position to, to decide those. So um, if we wish to enter again, that we uh, are not comfortable with the variances, we can say so. Um, from my point of view, I think that enough of it's been addressed and uh, in view of the project, you know, I'm, pr I'm probably okay to leave that to city council to decide those. Uh, I'm not gonna color that anymore with my opinion, but uh, we do need to have a set of recommendations here that we can agree on, so. You know, I would suggest that you and I are okay with the height at the moment. Let me qualify that. I'm not opposed to the height in principle. It's just that what they're trying to put in there has a knock-on effect on all these other things that if they could reduce the amount of accommodation that they're aiming for, they could fix all the other problems. But they're not prepared to budge on that. And you know, you say, well, maybe it's an economic decision that, uh, well, it's a very small site and uh, yes, you're allowed a FAR of two, but it's not, they can't make it work even at less than F, uh, FAR of two. So I'm opposed to the way it has been laid out. I'm sure that, there, there, you know, if there was some uh, more creative way of handling the extra accommodation, but I, I just, I can't see how 
uh, other than putting in a parkade, uh, how they can actually fix the parking uh, problems that they have there. So, you know, yes, the, uh, and I appreciate that they have made an attempt to, to uh, uh, include all the suggestions that we've made, and I think it is a better building for that, but I think it is still far short of where it should be. And I know it's maybe, maybe they can't do anything more. I think certainly with the way it's laid out now, it's, it's not gonna fix all the problems. No, <clears throat> although, you know, again, the, the FSR conforms and the height is part of a variance. So um, I'm not too sure what we can suggest at that point uh, to change things. Uh, you know, it's not like they're asking for, for more space than the site will accommodate. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, to be honest with you, like we don't often run into a, a difference of opinion on this. So I'm kind of looking for a little guidance here. Um, I mean, on a simple majority, I guess Bob and I are okay with it. Um, I'm not sure that's always the answer, but uh, again, I think we have a better building than we had. Uh, we did get a, st a setback in the height, which um, I know I particularly was concerned about um, taking a unit off does sort of break up the, the mass of that building uh, when you see it from the corner. Um, so at this stage of the game, um, you know, I'm probably um, in favor of just saying that we accept this project pretty much as submitted, but I don't mind putting the reservations in our, our recommendations again, that, uh, that we build the density and height uh, uh, are of concern but we can't say they're wrong. <laughs> the nature of the recommendations that we make are, uh, and I always have to go into those, I apologize for that. <laughs> Or can you uh, just give me a quick reminder of the page that has our uh, uh, our instructions? It's just on the second page. That's one I always flip past. Yeah, so we have the, the, the accepted as presented. Um, DP with variance accepted as presented, and that's what this is. It's a DP with variance, I, I assume. Um, do we want additional information? That's type three. Um, and the, the, the two types of projects, again, with and without variance, and request for reconsideration by the panel, which is what we did last time. So I guess from my position, I'm saying item two, Bob, is that what you're saying as well? Accept it as presented? And yes. We wanna make a record of it. Uh, uh, Ivan, you would probably wanna see this back a third, a third time. <laughs> yes, yeah. So the variance is still a separate item that's uh, outside of our jurisdiction and will be decided elsewhere, I guess. But uh, I think that's the one we have to, uh, to go forward with because it is subject to a variance. Two to one, I guess. Okay, so we just need a first and seconder for the adoption of that recommendation. We just need a, a first and seconder for the adoption of that recommendation. Okay, I can I can put motion forward. Okay. 
So I, guess, I think I'm going to have to second it because you're not in favor of this, Ivan. Is that correct? Yeah. So I will second it. <laughs> All right, Erica, thanks for your presentation. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you, Erica. Um, Eric, are you in attendance on online? Yeah, I'm here, Sarah. Okay, great. So Eric is our second presenter for today, Tony. Okay. Wonder if we might take a five minute break before the next project, uh, use the bathroom, whatever, a glass of water maybe. <laughs> we'll be right with you. Yeah. Blaine, what happens to us? I mean, we've talked so much about this. Um, you know, our
give up that control. <laughs> yeah, it dries you out too. Thank you. And this is one, the last one was one of the very small lots, you know, like really two houses, you know, where standard city lots were, were knocked down and that's all what you got to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so perhaps we get started with the the next presentation. So we're doing the uh, the numerous lots from 106 to 212 on Alberni Highway. Secondly, here, and uh, why don't we start the presentation on that one? Good morning, everyone. Uh, starting with 140 Jensen, is that what you were talking about, Tony? Yes. The uh, okay. Perfect. The two buildings, yeah, we Perfect. put that up on the screen. Awesome, great, perfect. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, my name is Christina Wilson. I am the representative for High Street Ventures and High Street Architecture. We have Eric, who's sharing his screen. Um, Delorme, he's a representative for High Street Ventures. And we have Will Pakolik, who's our landscape architect, who we'll be speaking to in a little bit, uh, who is representing, obviously, the landscape side of the project. Uh, this project site is located at 140 Jensen Avenue. It's in a highly visible area of Parksville. It is the intention of this development to provide the city of Parksville with an aesthetically pleasing architecture and landscape design, ultimately contributing to the revitalization of the downtown core. We will further complement the proposed development by designing and constructing to step four of the BC Energy Step Code. The building electricity will be supplemented with rooftop solar and provision of all underground parking stalls to be EV ready. The development has been designed to minimize the footprint and achieve the maximum density per the zoning by the city. This next slide shows a little bit of context of, from the views of, uh, currently of the property. The site is a vac currently a vacant parcel of land. Um, the view that you see on the bottom left is looking from Jensen and Craig to the Southwest. The view two in the top right is looking at Jensen uh, and Alberni to the Southeast. View three in the middle is you enter Parksville along Alberni and Lee Avenue looking Northeast. And view four on the bottom right is from Craig Street and Lee Avenue looking Northwest. This slide represents a bit of the uh, pedestrian and ve vehicle, sorry, vehicular circulation. Um, the study shows how well this development is surrounded by collector arterial and downtown roads. The existing arterial roads are indicated with the red dashed line. The existing collector roads are indicated with the orange dashed line. The existing downtown roads are indicated with the green dashed line. And the blue dashed line it indicates um, the existing pedestrian sidewalks. High Street is proposing to uh, include new sidewalks, which are shown on the, as the yellow dash line along Alberni and Lee Avenue, thus improving pedestrian circulation and access around the site and throughout the neighborhood. The site went through um, some design evolution as we were working through uh, with staff on this project. Um, good design is always an outcome of multiple possibilities and this development was no exception. With the narrow site and close proximity to busy arterial roads and the existing residential uh, neighborhood, the challenges were evident and the design team had looked into various possibilities to resolve those and achieve the best option that would overcome, overcome those challenges. The first option uh, that we had looked at was the original design where we had placed the buildings along Lee Avenue and exposed surface parking fronting Jensen. This option created a bit of close proximity to the existing single family residential homes. So the next step was to try to alleviate that by uh, option two there on the bottom left where we looked at staggering to the two buildings along both Lee Avenue and Jensen and uh, partly exposing the parking fronting Jensen. This option continued to have the close proximity issues with the existing single family homes along Lee. And it also resu resulted in a little more hardscape by having to have two parkade ramps to each building. We then evolved to option three there um, in the kind of middle of your screen at the top. Uh, we moved both buildings to place them along Jensen Avenue. This created an opportunity for street front development and encouraging visual connectivity from the public realm and moving the buildings away from the existing residential neighborhood. We weren't quite finished tweaking and option four, which is the bottom right site plan that you see is the option that's being presented today. It's the final iteration that created an L-shaped building that provided more articulation and connectivity to the street frontage and pedestrian realm while defining the site and maximizing the density. This next slide talks, uh, speaks to our architectural facade and design. The influences were interpreted in a modern context to obtain 
a facade character that would withstand the testimony of time into the foreseeable future. The distinct horizontal and vertical, sorry, vertical articulations are achieved using building forms that break up mass and provide relief to the pedestrian realm. We have distinct articulation, including projected separated roof canopies, finished with a cedar type lap siding panels and raised parapets. The build out form, building forms create vertical breaks as well as frames a portion of the building face, thus breaking the length into smaller, uh, easily perceived forms. The architectural facade treatment has been applied on all four sides of the buildings with equal importance. And the colors and the textures that were chosen are kind of based on the natural material and waterfront theme inspired by the coastal char characteristics of white coral, sand and water. And the, we use that with the vert, vert, sorry, vertical articulation breaks achieved with color tiles that resemble water ripples that are distinct and kind of clearly break out that building mass. We chose to put the strong color palettes at the bottom of, to bring human scale to the ground with the lighter colors at the top to minimize the visual impact and create sort of an ombre like effect. And the bottom of the right of your screen, you will see um, a double height canopy entrance. This creates distinctly uh, visible building entrances. Um, it is double height and as you enter the building, it, it maintains its double height to have a grand effect. And there are natural materials um, used in, for the uh, framing out of that entrance. Mechanical screening has been thoughtfully considered on this project and integrated to co complement the materials used on the building facade and conceal the rooftop mechanical systems to ensure that the equipment is not visible from the street. The following slides sort of give you, helps you uh, visualize the architectural features and landscaping elements from different intersections that will provide distinct definition of this development as would be perceived from a pedestrian realm. This first slide is a view from Jensen and Craig looking southwest. Second slide is a view from Jensen and Alberni looking southeast, where you can see um, the L-shaped portion and that vertical articulation in the center with the ripple effect. And this final slide, um, the top left is an aerial shot to sort of highlight the solar panels that are covering the rooftop. These solar panels will cover the common area building usage, including the EV charging stalls. The bottom right is a view from Alberni as you kind of enter the city looking northeast at the building. So I'm gonna pass it over to Will Pakalik. He is our landscape architect and he'll be walking you through the landscape features of the property. Thank you, Christina. Um, I guess I would like to start by uh, outlining and highlighting the fact that this site has four very distinct edge conditions and adjacencies with the residential to the south, um, institutional uh, to the east, a very commercial urban scale to the north, and then we have um, fire services to the west. So being able to design the site and articulate the plan from a um, a very responsive contextually sensitive design lens was one of the team's key priorities. So what we've tried to achieve through this is number one is pedestrian connectivity and accessibility throughout while maintaining that, that appropriate scale and screening. Specifically, I'll start at Lee Avenue on the south side where we have tried our, um, our best to provide screening and that is in two different forms through uh, fencing of architectural interest as well as uh, vegetation to help buffer that edge. As we move over to the east side, um, we have that priority to pedestrian connectivity through the site while acknowledging that we've had significant grading challenges to be able to achieve the overall layout. As we go to the north, we're seeing the landscaping come straight up to the sidewalk to create a strong urban edge with minimizing our site setbacks. We're vegetating that northern edge to make sure that we're not feeling overwhelmed by a building interfacing right up along Jensen. And then Alberni, I think, is one of the more uh, critical components as Alberni is the gateway into the downtown core. And with this development, what we're trying to achieve is a complementary artistic element, which you can see labeled on this slide as number nine. We've created a art feature, which we are proposing within the site that would be complementary to both the building as well as the city of Parkville um, building and material palette and color scheme. And that really creates that welcoming environment for people coming into the core and onto the beachfront. Eric, could you go to the next slide for me? 
Thank you very much. So what we really wanted to highlight in the following slides was the contextual sensitivity. So this section is taken um, a little bit further to the west. Um, and what you're seeing here is that terraced approach. So we're keeping that strong edge to the public realm with raised vegetated planting. Next slide, Eric. Now this is on the south side of the site and bearing in mind the contextual uh, reference here is that we have single family residential to the south. And so what we're proposing is vegetation um, in front of the, the screening as well as a uh, lush urban canopy and a boulevard as well as the new uh, pedestrian sidewalk to increase connectivity. It is to be noted that all of the plants throughout the site are going to be irrigated. We are capturing storm water through a cistern system, utilizing drip irrigation. We will be um, making sure that all of the plant material um, is lush and green. Further to that, the maintenance on the plant material will be managed by on-site um, uh, teams to make sure that we're getting that design intent that we were looking to achieve right from the beginning. Next slide. Perfect, so as we heard in the last presentation, site triangles are a critical element. We wanted to highlight the fact that we are within our setbacks and we are being contextually sensitive with the plant material selections to ensure that we are having low plant materials, not obstructing the visibility corner, especially given that Craig coming on to Jensen is going to be a busy intersection. So we have lowered all of the plant materials and are very cognizant of the fact that that site triangle needs to be achieved. Next slide. Perfect, so this is the fencing just to the northwest of the site along Alberni and approaching Jensen. The reason why we've proposed screening fencing here is for consideration that as vehicles move to the east along Jensen and uh, the traffic movements, we need to be sensitive to the fact that these are residential units and headlights going into the units will be a uh, significant um, encumbrance upon the residents living there and the enjoyment of their space. So what we've tried to do is create this architecturally interesting fence with uh, vines growing up it uh, to create that uh, vegetated feel. So it appears to be a green wall and it is just vines growing up the fence, trying to balance the considerations between visibility, permeability and enjoyment for the residents and for the citizens of Parksville. Next slide. Perfect. So. I wanted to take a moment just to speak a little bit to the amenity space. So between the buildings on the east and the west, we saw this as a key opportunity to create an amenity space for uh, the residents and to the visitors of this site. Um, and it's also important to note that we are over top of a parking lot. So all of our parking being under the buildings, uh, we're limited in what sort of landscaping treatments we can provide. So as we terrace up, what you're actually seeing on the left side of this section is the underground parking lot. And then on the right is the public realm. So what we've tried to do is break up the vertical impact through terracing, creating a vegetated buffer and then architecturally interesting uh, fencing. And then we have a pergola type structure, which Eric, if you can jump to the next slide for me, um, you can see from the road perspective here that this is creating a shelter structure that will act as a community gathering space. The access is from within the site we did um, we did entertain having the opportunity to try and connect directly to Jensen. Unfortunately, given the parking, the parkade uh, limitations and the structure itself, we were not able to achieve permeability through a staircase or even through um, a ramp system that we could make that uh, connection from Jensen to within the site in this specific location. So we've limited the site, the access from the south, and have created a community level minor amenity space, which will be lit with solar lighting. Um, and the pergola structure will be matching the architectural form and character. Next slide. And I'll pass the uh, sun solar analysis over to Christina. Thanks, Will. Uh, yeah, so we conducted a shadow study that was carried out during uh, winter, spring and summer. Winter is shown on the top row, spring is in the middle and the summer is shown on the bottom. The main concern always with shadowing is obviously the impact to the residential uh, buildings and the surrounding neighborhoods. As you can see, there, there is no impact to the existing residential neighborhood um, that is to the uh, south. And uh, overall, the impact to the north is uh, actually quite minimal. 
And, you know, great neighborhoods don't happen by accident. They are the result of careful planning and thoughtful design that creates places that are sustainable, walkable, vibrant, social, and livable, which increase the quality of life for residents of all ages and incomes. And High Street foresees this development contributing to the prosperity of the city and attracting new people, new business, and creating vitality while allowing the city to respond to change over time. And this development responds positively to the downtown redevelopment vision um, that we have uh, determined by the city. And we thank you for your time and are open to any questions you may have. So once again, folks, let, let's keep this part to questions and then we'll go to comments afterwards. So uh, um, any particular questions? And we'll start with you, Ivan. <clears throat> Do you know if the uh, hydro poles on, on Jensen, is, is there any plan to have that removed, put that underground? Yes, good question, Ivan. Yes, that is the plan. We are working with BC Hydro. We have been uh, since we've uh, put this land under contract and uh, we are looking to underground all of that infrastructure. Uh, it benefits the community, obviously, and this proposed development and that street realm. And uh, yeah, we're working through it and the design has been complete and just working through with the utility company on that. Um, but that is the intention. I didn't hear. Oh, uh, they are working to uh, relocate the hydro, but it's, they're working with, uh, you know, BC Hydro on that. But uh, yeah, visually that would be a nice thing, definitely. More questions, Ivan? We will come back around, so. so what, um, <clears throat> about the, the fencing that you have on Alberni Highway, and, and I see now the rationale for uh, car headlights, I, I, I never thought about that, but couldn't that be uh, better handled with landscaping, you know, a hedge or something that would be softer than, than a, fence that's a that's a very good question and uh thank you for that um through our design process what we had noted uh, when you're looking at that uh the landscape rendered site plan would be ideal um what we were considering is um site connectivity as, as well as sept head issues so if we were to plant that area um where that section dd number six is what we would find to have any meaningful space is we'd need two meters off of that property line, which essentially puts us right at the, uh, the building facade. And that's going to limit our permeability within the site. Um, and that was something we were trying to avoid. Um, could it be accommodated? Yes, it could. Um, from our perspective, what we were trying to achieve is a minimal footprint to be able to create that green wall. It's a little bit deceptive, I think, saying that it's just a fence, where in reality, yes, it is a fence, but it will be covered in um, vines, with, so it'll essentially be very much like the last proponent's um, presentation of a green wall where you have vines growing up, it will change with season. Um, so you'll get the nice colors in the fall, green in the spring. So although it is a vertical wall and a fence, it won't be a traditional fence in that it's covered in vines. Does that answer your question? Bob, any questions from your end? Uh, just on the utilities, um, does this building, is it entirely electric or does it have a gas utility as well? Uh, it is uh, entirely electric. All of our projects and everything that we build, we do entirely electric. Can, can you talk some more about the uh, PV array on the roof and how you plan to handle that and what capacity it is? Sorry, Ivan, I'm not sure I even caught what that was. The, the rail on the roof? Uh, okay. The, uh, the sorry, I, I, Ivan, I believe I understand what the question is. Yeah. Um, we are, sorry, can, can you hear me? I've been operating on mute. <laughs> at this. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, excellent. Um, so this is BC Hydro territory, uh, meaning that BC Hydro puts a constraint of 100 kilowatt hours AC per net meter per building. Uh, and we are operating within those limitations. So we model the electric demand for each building and we'll provide the amount of uh, 
annual electric generation up until 100 kilowatts AC um, so that we, we don't over provide. Um, does that answer your question? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it all. I'm, I'm very hard of hearing and the acoustics in this place suck. So uh, I didn't get it all. But what, I, what I'm trying to find out is um, what size of, of array is that? Are those panels lying flat on the roof or are they tilted to the correct azimuth? Uh, you know, it, 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 it's a nice drawing, but what is it actually doing there? Yeah, great question. Um, based on the annual insulation of the area, uh, we will be using a 10 degree tilt that maximizes the amount of solar potential um, for all seasons in this area. Um, and then the cell size of the photovoltaics, um, we operate anywhere from a 62 to a 72 cell photovoltaic. Um, the array size will be anywhere from uh, 250 to 300 panels per building. How, how many kilowatt hours does that represent? On it, well, it, it will depend on the size or the cell of the photovoltaic. Um, we will operate just up until the BC allowance of 100 kilowatt hours AC. And you were done, Bob, with your questions. Had just a, just a couple of questions here. Um, was any thought given to, um, you have amenity space on the main level, I appreciate that, and yet you have this uh, uh, roof area that still seems to have some space available. Did you ever give any thought to a rooftop garden? And I'm assuming this is a rental property, so for the use of the residents. Yeah, we had, uh, we had looked at uh, rooftop amenity space and um, honestly to try to get the solar up there, there isn't a lot of room left over for it. And, and that's kind of our uh, main uh, focus is the energy efficiency, you know, building our buildings to the highest level that is out there by uh, regulated right now with the government and, and having the solar on the roof. So to, to get that in and the e exit and the access that you would need, when you have a rooftop patio spaces, you have to um, provide uh, two exits. And that became challenging with the solar and the um, pathways that you need around it for fire safety. So that's sort of why we didn't uh, go that direction. Your comment about rental, actually we're looking at this as a condo property currently Okay. Uh, thanks. at this point. Okay, I thought that might be the answer, but I thought I'd ask. Um, okay, let's swing back to comments now. So we'll, we'll go back to you, Ivan, if you have uh, commentary, we'll, we'll go around. Uh, first, I'd like to compliment you on your presentation. Uh, you've uh, provided us with a, this, uh, a lot of information and, and uh, good views of the project. Um, I just don't know why it's referred to as Jensen when the only connection to Jensen is the parkade entrance. It should be called Lee Avenue. Um, but this building, it, like the one across the street that you, is coming up next, it, it, um, it occupies a very significant location at the entrance to the downtown. And uh, it's very important that I guess we get it all right. So uh, with, with the variances that are requested, um, again, with the parking, narrow, uh, lo lowering the uh, requirements for the maneuvering aisle from seven and a half meters to seven meters, I, I'm opposed to, to lowering standards uh, unless there's a really good uh, reason for that. Um, in the same way that you want to reduce the, uh, uh, the number of uh, standard spaces to 58% from 70%. Uh, maybe you have a good reason for that and we'll get to, to, to that. Um, the one I don't understand is uh, 
relax the minimum distance between off street parking spaces and the property line abutting a public highway from three meters to 1.2. I don't see where that one, why that's necessary or why you want to do that. Um, reduce the uh, refuse removal requirements to one combined removal area for the two buildings. So I think that the refuse storage, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in this Moloch system. I think it, it seems to be a, a good idea, uh, but I think it's already quite far for some of the occupants to use. And, you know, it's maybe more convenient for the garbage collector than for the comfort of the occupants, because uh, I think people with disabilities to go that distance to drop their garbage in, in winter or in the rain and that, I, I think that's, uh, that's a little unfair. And maybe there needs to be two such uh, garbage areas and uh, closer to, to, to the entrances or, or access for the, the, uh, the occupants. Um, Relax the required width of continuous landscaping along the southern boundary on, on Lee Avenue. Well, it's kind of a little ask there. Can't see it, but that's not too bad. Um, and remove the requirement for refuse removal areas to be screened on three sides by a fence or wall, these two meters. I have no objection to, to that, um, just the location of the bins, I think. So, um, I want to first talk about the siting of the building. You know, I don't know why uh, you, you need 28 additional parking stalls over the amount required, because it seems to me that that pushes the whole building tighter onto Jensen, that, um, which is the rear yard of the building. And it's, uh, it sort of creates an uncomfortable canyon effect on, on on that side, making the building very tall and very close to the sidewalk. Um, we talked about the hydro poles, that, that would be a real eyesore right there. Um, so I think with, with one row of parking on the Lee Avenue side, there is still a decent space between the proposed building and the existing houses across the road. And, and you, you already have all the parking that you require there. Uh, the surface parking and drive aisle would be better served by a drive through roadway rather than a dead end roadway. I think if there were two entrances there, it would, it would make it a lot better. Uh, it, it would also give better identity to the entrances of the buildings themselves which uh, the, one, the one on the west side is sort of tucked away in a corner and it's not easily identifiable. Uh, it will also help other traffic like cabs, ambulances and deliveries to, to be able to get through there a lot easier. And so instead of maybe two rows of right angle parking, maybe you could have a row of parallel parking on the south side of the drive aisle. Um, that would also give you space for loading or other service parking on that side. Building setback on our Bernie Highway is welcome. Uh, also, I wonder about the, the piece of fencing and um, okay, answered a lot of the questions I had here. Um, uh, okay, the other thing is, uh, I wonder about the shed roofs that you have everywhere there. It seems like it's kind of a popular fad right now amongst architects, but they, they offer no shade or weather protection, and they just make the building look much taller than, than, it, than it should. <clears throat> So uh, maybe if, if there were pitch roofs on, on, the, on the building, uh, it would also fit um, 
will offer some shade and weather protection and also tie into the, the streetscape requirements for the downtown core zone, which is just across the street and would make the building look lower. Um, the color palette is funky. It's, um, I think that uh, the area of the large cubist style display on the corner of Jensen and Alberni um, would be an excellent opportunity for some indigenous art motif instead of which, um, instead of that, and it would say something more relevant about Parksville's West Coast position. And similarly, the piece of public art shown alongside Alberni Highway would be more appropriately indigenous, I think. Um, I, I think you've done a great job of the uh, water energy conservation and greenhouse gas emissions section. That's uh, you're one of the few projects I've seen here in a long time that actually has tried to address this and I commend you for that. Um, and just one minor note here, I see that you specified some sunset maples and they're beautiful trees. I've got two of them, but I can tell you they're not drought tolerant. They really struggle in the summer. So anyway, I think overall it's a, it's, it's a very nice project. And uh, uh, one other thing that I like, you haven't done it as much on this one as on the other one, but with the um, siding going from darker to light, it, it makes the building sort of disappear and it makes it much lighter, but you've still got some areas where it's quite dark at the top. I think the building would benefit from uh, having it graded from dark to light at the top there. And those are my comments. Thank you. Bob, well, I like the color palette. And uh, yeah, I, I'm recently experiencing the accessibility issues. And so that walk to the uh, refuse collection points might present a problem, might be worth looking at. And uh, quite a lot of parking. I'm, I was trying to see where all the uh, uh, accessible parking spots were, wheelchair accessible parking spots. I think there are plenty there, but maybe a slight different location. Maybe okay, but I think it. I think it's very good overall. That that not much to comment on. Yeah. Okay, well, I, ad I admire the fact that you're taking on a very important corner in Parksville, um, entering and exiting on Alberni Highway. This is gonna have a very big impact. Um, I would have to say I'm generally uh, very complimentary of what you've done. I, I very much like your color palette and uh, I, I feel like the blue does identify with Parksville and that we're an oceanside town. And I think you've tried to reflect that. And uh, I really like the fact that not to jump to the next project, but there is a coherent kind of vocabulary to these two buildings being across the street from each other. So uh, I have to say, I like that. Um, I think I would, um, I would agree with the, the refuse container um, situation. Um, this is a really long site and uh, it does look like a fairly long walk. Um, and I would also at least question whether um, the, there could be a, a two exit situation from the parking. Um, there may be grading ver, uh, reasons for that and you can address that afterwards if you would. Um, but um, it's a long ways down to a, a kind of a dead end at each, at each end and it might be nice to be able to circulate, but maybe you can explain to us what your rationale was for that. Um, I'm guessing the extra parking is because you're selling these units. And uh, normally for rental, you would probably do one car per, uh, per apartment, and that would be it as per our previous uh, building. But is it, can I assume that this is because some people want two parking stalls when they buy a condominium? 
Um, yeah, actually, whether it's rental or condo, we've we've built over 3,000 homes and we mm -hmm. sort of know what the market demand is and the parking that we've shown would would, would but what we would want either way. It's mm -hmm. what's demanded in the marketplace. Um, yeah, I kind of wondered because it's not everybody has a, just one car. Um, but again, thought I'd ask. Um, yeah, overall, um, really great job on the landscaping. Um, really great job on the energy uh, conservation. I, I have to uh, agree with both those points. Um, this is like really nicely screened. Um, I like the fences with the, the vines on them. Um, I have to admit to that. If I had one comment, it's a very, very long project with the roof all at the same elevation. And I have um, uh, no idea exactly how you could break that up. But when I look at your elevations, particularly along Jensen, I see a very long roof at all, all at the same elevation. Um, so I don't know if there's any opportunity to pop some of these up a little bit. Uh, I don't know if that's even exacerbating your problem with height, um, but uh, a little more articulation and height would sure be nice. Um, I think that's, uh, that's really about it. Um, uh, I think it's one of the better looking buildings we've seen come in here. And as I say, I, I quite like the color palette, which I can't say all the time. <laughs> Um, so if I raised anything there that you can answer, uh, kind of right off the cuff, like particularly the, the, the garbage containers, the, uh, the entrance to the parking, could you address that? Yeah. Um, Christina and Eric, I'll, I'll let you, um, speak to it if I miss any points, but, um, I think one of the key considerations that we were looking at specifically about the dry aisle, I want to address that first. So our, and maybe you can go to the site plan for me, Eric. Um, so in our earliest iterations of this plan, the only way to achieve all of the um, requirements would have been to have the parking up against the, the patio spaces and the building facade. And that was a significant concern from our design team um, and from High Street in general, that we didn't want the vehicles right up to the building, although that would pass the variances in the bylaws uh, as required. So what we had to do was, uh, in our mind, was make that pedestrian connection in front of the buildings and to be able to achieve that and add some screening, uh, some foundation planting. So to achieve that, what we needed to do was look at shortening the length of the parking stalls on, at the surface slightly and reduce the lane width, uh, the drive lane width, and then also reduce the planting. So this was a, a concession and we tried to balance those considerations from vehicular realm, from the uh, pedestrian realm and from the public realm. Um, we recognize that we prefer to have wider walks, you know, what, two meter walks in front of our buildings. Unfortunately, we weren't able to achieve that. So we took a little from there, our uh, length of parking, depth of parking. We took a little from there. We took a little from the, um, the, the drive lane and then took a little from the landscape screening and added the fencing. So what we tried to do was balance all of the considerations uh, to create an optimum site condition for all of these different things. So instead of trying to take it all from one, we tried to take a little from each. And you see that as a, um, a couple of variances. One was the, the vegetation requirement of uh, 300 mils, the 500 mils from the drive lane, and then also the reduced depth of the parking. Um, so that was a key consideration for us. Now, right where the number seven is on this map, where um, that was something that we went through many iterations as a design team um, to make that connectivity out onto Craig. And I fully, and I think I could speak for the whole design team, agree that we would love to make that connection. Our limitation is the fact that it is too close to the Lee Avenue uh, intersection um, to meet requirements. So we wanted to make a connection there, um, notwithstanding the grading considerations. It was too close to make that right hand movement. And so we had to abandon the idea. Uh, it was considered early on in the design process, but unfortunately did not fit within our site. Um, now, that was the two points of access, the, the Molochs um, and the waste receptacle locations. That again was another consideration that we had many iterations. We thought perhaps um, splitting the units and uh, locating them either central right where the number six icon is uh, below the building on the right um, or over where the number seven is on the far east side of the site. 
um, our concern was how visible the, the waste receptacles would be to the public realm, how well we could screen them. If we moved the waste receptacles to where say number six was, um, we'd lose uh, a significant number of parking. And as Christina had alluded to, we're trying to meet our minimum market demanded parking stalls. So that became a little bit um, of a no-go. And then if we were to move it over by the transformer where the number eight is located in the Southeast corner of the site, it really becomes a pick um, It's the same distance from that building, whether it's a central location or whether it's off in that, that corner. So separating them for the sake of separating them, it, we didn't feel as a design team that it made a significant impact. And we are very cognizant of the accessibility and we wanna maximize uh, accessibility for all residents as well. So the only other location that we had identified as a project team was over by that number three in the Southwest corner. Our concern with that location is its proximity to the unit. And I think I could speak for virtually everyone that they would not appreciate having waste receptacles in that kind of proximity to their unit. So we landed on this central location, given that we have sidewalks, drop curbs and a crosswalk right to that location. Um, so is it ideal? It, it isn't ideal, but it is the best outcome that we could identify as a project team by centralizing it and giving full accessible access throughout. And granted that, you know, there will be winter conditions, but I'm not sure that we'll alleviate those concerns by splitting them and having them closer to the buildings, uh, the building entrances themselves. Um, there was a comment about the sunset maple trees and that is absolutely a fair point that it is not a drought tolerant plant. We did identify that it was not drought tolerant and I'd highlight the fact that we tried to achieve about 85 plus percent of drought tolerant species within our site. 100% of the plant material that we did specify was based on recommendations from local nurseries and growers based on their performance. And we definitely acknowledge that um, maples being that they need water, um, having an irrigation system fed through cisterns. Um, we felt that the aesthetic value and architectural character of that tree uh, was worthy of consideration to offset uh, the drought tolerant uh, consideration. So again, we tried to capture 85% or better with tolerance. Um, and we very selectively picked our spots to um, have ones that maybe weren't, and it was specifically for their uh, character and color. Um, last point that I took a note of that I feel like I could answer was the uh, indigenous art. Um, I, I tend to agree and I'll let um, Christina and Eric speak to uh, procurement a little bit more. Um, so this was a design by uh, the landscape architectural team, the art component with uh, feedback from architectural. Um, I'm not an indigenous person. I would feel very disingenuous to try and emulate indigenous art. So at this point, we're proposing an architectural feature as opposed to an indigenous. And I think High Street in general, uh, I could speak for them a little bit and say that we are open and welcoming to uh, collaboration with indigenous uh, artists and would welcome an opportunity to work with the city of Parksville to explore design options for that art piece. I'll, I'll let Christina and Eric uh, supplement and add to that a little bit. You did a great job, Will. I don't think there's anything to supplement. And yeah, what Will said about the art, yeah, we're definitely open. Open to that if the city wants to um, have some more input in working with local artists or whatnot. To We recognize that it is the entrance into the city and the City of Parksville sign that's already there. So we're definitely open to that discussion. Okay. Anything else before we think of putting together some uh, recommendations? Sorry, I should get closer here. Anything else before we? Uh... So what about the, uh, the drive aisle for the, uh, the parking? Is it possible to get two, two access points instead of the one? I think they just explained that they uh, they couldn't do that because the corner at uh, at Craig was inhibiting them with not having enough uh, distance to the intersection. Were you thinking of a different location? Okay. Apparently, the the one at at item seven is too close to the intersection, Ivan. The uh, the um, there's a limiting distance where they can come out of that parking lot, and at that one is too close. Not sure I understand. Did 
even then it would be, uh, I, I think the same corner distance, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, if we came out on Lee, we would actually have to, to have um, a limiting distance in, in the same manner that we did on Craig, is that correct? Correct, yeah. So I think we've identified that maybe that piece of artwork, um, I would agree with you, that might be nice if it was uh, an indigenous piece. I don't know that I'd be in favor of the, the, the nice piece that they've got on the building being changed because it keys into the one across the street that we're gonna be talking about next color wise and palette wise. Yeah. So maybe a compromise would be to have the art piece uh, looked at as opposed to the building mosaic, if you wanna call it that. Mm -hmm. So, which points do we do we want to make with this building, um, and how do we want to make our recommendation to council? Once again, keeping in mind that the uh, the zoning amendments are going to be, you know, there. Um, they're a major consideration, but if we have an opinion. Well, it seems like from what the previous presentation told us, the seven meter width um, has been incorporated into the overall stall plus drive aisle widths in other municipalities such that uh, um, it's kind of hard to see, um, you know, and maybe you could actually tell us that too. The previous proponent told us they had 18.6 meters, I believe from uh, edge of stall to edge of stall and, and justified the seven meters with the, uh, the overall width of the double loaded parking drive aisle. Do you know what that dimension is here? Yeah, it's 17.4 meters. And I will just point out that it, we work in a lot of different municipalities and seven meters is very standard. This is the first time we've actually encountered the seven and a half. Yeah, I, I guess that's a city um, a requirement. Um, I've designed a lot of parking structures as well and they've all been seven meters. Um, so I, I can't, fundamentally object to it. I've seen it elsewhere. <laughs> um, and I guess that your overall width uh, reflects the fact that these surface parking stalls are, are the, the, the short ones. Is that correct? Correct. Are these all the 5.8s? I'll, I'll let Eric speak to that one second. <laughs> Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, the uh, the stall depths have been shortened to the small stall requirements for the surface parking. Um, however, the width has not. Um, we are still maintaining the 2.75 meter width. Mm -hmm. Okay. And by the way, before we go to those recommendations, I, uh, I would like to go to Marilyn again, just for her input, uh, if you don't mind, Marilyn. Yeah, thanks, Tony. And that was a fabulous presentation. It's, it, you explained an awful lot and gave us a very few questions to ask, I think, uh, as um, most presentations leave us with a lot of questions. Um, I just have to say, many of the panel members, they covered off, I, I should say the panel members covered off many of my questions, you know, the hydro poles, it's strata, um, thinking about your future maintenance uh, for plantings, very thorough presentation. Um, I would have to say, I agree with the, uh, we, we have in our OCP about uh, slope proof. So it might be nice to see if there were a possibility of just wondering whether or not you could consider that issue. Um, I think the Mollocks are a great idea. 
really impressed with your energy step code four and your THG initiatives on this project. Um, the only thing that I see that doesn't fit with our OCP is the white, and yet somehow it seems to fit with your building because the color palette is, is very West Coast, uh, Parksville for sure. Um, and the art, I think Ivan brought up the artwork, which was something I was thinking about, whether it be indigenous or, or whether you work with a local uh, artist. We, we have another project that um, was ongoing in the city of Parksville as well with some of the local artists and our um, um, art gallery here. Um, nice to see that you're wrapping the hydro boxes too, and you've taken advantage of that program. There are many who have, but it's a great idea. So all in all, I think it's a really beautiful project. Thank you. Yeah, regarding the art piece that you have, I, I just wanted to say too, that I do see that you reflected the building architecture in the shapes of the, the framing um, pieces in it. So I don't know if it's possible to retain that and incorporate an indigenous uh, theme to the, the, the parts that, are, that fill in those frames. But I, I, uh, I did appreciate what you were trying to do there and show the, the same vertical and uh, 90 degree elements you had on the building. Uh, just to address the sloped uh, roof, the reason that we go flat is for the solar to maximize the amount that we can put on the rooftops. Um, you know, with canopy projections, you potentially could look at a little bit of sloping, but we try to avoid um, really like sloped pitches because we it is really important to us to, to get that solar on the roof um, and maximize what we can based on what we're limited to with BC Hydro, but also um, what we can achieve ourselves. So that's just to, just to make a comment on that because it came up twice. I'll just respond to that, Christine, and thank you for that. I, I pretty well assumed that was the case and I think it might be a fair trade-off considering you're going to put photovoltaics on the, on the roof. So that's much appreciated, thank you. So <clears throat> specific recommendations, we have, we have the art. So that one we've agreed on. Is there anything else that we would like to, uh, to put in our recommendations? I think the shed roofs, I, I think they, they serve no purpose and they're just bizarre sitting up there doing nothing. There's no, no shade, no weather protection. Uh, you know, I think, I think uh, it, something better could be done. Um, and I would suggest uh, some pitched roof over those areas uh, might be a, a more useful solution or they could have uh, um, a flat roof that was uh, suspended off the building that would make it. But uh, you know, right now those uh, those shed roofs do nothing. So that would be a, a suggestion. Maybe we could just suggest, since a, a few of us have kind of brought it up, that they. Um, we just re-examine the roofs for other design possibilities without being specific. And maybe we could leave that with you. You've heard a little bit of the input here. I don't think the, uh, the guidelines that we, we use here that ask for sloped roofs in a more residential sense or even the color palettes that we have are necessarily meant to inhibit good architecture either. So, um, uh, but at the same time, um, it might just be a consideration to, to re-examine them and see if there's anything that could be done to, uh, to offer a little more protection or anything more in, in the design element and, and possibly even you know, that whole matter of articulating the building a little bit vertically. But rather than be specific, uh, I think we would just leave that with you as a review item. I guess as a, as a panel, do we want to um, ask them to, 
to give at least further consideration to the, the waste disposal because it did come up several times. Well, essentially that, uh, you know, they, were, they ran through a number of options and this seemed to be the best one and that there was still a, a pretty fair travel distance involved, even if it was split in two. Um, but once again, rather than um, direct them how to do it, um, can you see if there's any, and I, I know you've considered options already, but could you, could you look at that? I think if I lived there, I would, and I lived at the, the far end unit, it could become a small aggravation. <laughs> Again, not a direction to do so, but uh, but you know it, it's come up several times in the in the panel, and usually that's an indication that uh, it might not be a bad idea. And I don't think we can say anything about the hydro poles. That's under consideration, and it's outside of our jurisdiction. Am I correct there? Yeah. That's all I would have. Yeah. So uh, nice building. Thanks for the presentation. I know you're going to give us another one across the street, but maybe we'll uh, we'll just get our recommendations together here. That uh, I think we're going to say um, back to my book. So this one is also a variance. Um, we want to go all the way. I guess it, we're, we're saying additional information because we have identified points here. So. Um, it's not accepted totally as presented. We are asking for a, a few things to be considered, but we don't want to have it brought back to us. We're happy with it uh, otherwise. So Sarah, we have to find some parts of the guidelines that uh, talk about the specific uh, areas in, in this uh, zone that we're reflecting. Yeah. So um, it's always helpful to tie it back to a guideline. Um, that being said, with this one, it's in development permit area number three, not mm -hmm. in the downtown. And so if you can find some guidelines in there that relate to some of the aspects you're discussing, that's always helpful. Um, the other option is we could just generally list some of the items that you'd like them to reconsider and not tie it back to a guideline. And I was just quickly going through here and I'm not not seeing a guideline that necessarily relates to some of your comments, um, but if you're able to find one and, and tie it to it, please let me know. And You know, I think I, I would favor the, the three specific items we talked about and not nail them to the guidelines. So okay. we had the artwork, indigenous, uh, a reconsideration of the roof form uh, without specific uh, recommendations and uh, we examine the possibility of two refuse areas. Otherwise, I think that's a thumbs up. So, <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to read back what I have in my notes, and I know Wendy's at her desk right now taking notes as well. Um, so some of the the three items is re-examine the roof form from an articulation and design element perspective as well as weather protection aspects. Um, consider opportunities for artwork and um, potential for indigenous art on the corner of Jensen and Alberni. Correct. And reconsider the location and options for two refuse removal areas. Yep. Um, so we just need a first and a seconder of the recommendation if you're satisfied with that one. Ivan moves. Um... Bob seconds. <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> All right, so um, just a five minute break and we'll. Uh, um, Ivan, or Tony, sorry. I'd just yep. like to remind you right now it's 12.09 and we do have to vacate the building by one o'clock. Okay. Well, you know, the um, actually, given that, maybe is everybody comfortable just going on with the next one then? You're ready to go? Okay, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, we're ready Not to bad, go. we're only nine minutes behind at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll just get our screen up here and then we'll start. Perfect. So a lot of what you hear is going to be similar. Um, obviously design elements are things that we took from 
the previous project we wanted to pull over and incorporate into this project. Um, so this project located at 164 Alberni Highway and 113 Jensen Avenue. It's in a highly visible area of Parksville as you enter the city. Um, and the intention again is to, you know, provide something aesthetically pleasing um, with the landscape design and um, the building itself to revitalize the downtown core. This building as well will be BC Energy Step Code 4. Again, uh, solar on the rooftops that will cover the uh, common area spaces and the uh, provision of underground parking stalls to be EV ready. This site as well is located on, uh, or currently is a vacant parcel of land. Uh, the bottom left view is looking from Jensen Avenue uh, to the Northwest. The top right is looking from Alberni to the East. The, the view in the middle there, number three, is in the as you enter Parksville along Alberni and Jensen, looking northeast. And the bottom one on your right uh, is uh, the lane bisecting the properties uh, looking to the south. The uh, design evolution of this site uh, didn't have as many iterations. It being a smaller parcel, we were limited in, in the design of this parcel. So it's a smaller scale. Um, it was designed to place the building closer to the street line to reinforce the street edge, building entrances and pedestrian scale. The orientation of the commercial areas are along the more prominent Alberni Highway and uh, promote that strong pedestrian connectivity. And the vehicle access is tucked away in the lane uh, behind the building and not visible from the primary arterial road of Alberni. And parking is provided on the adjacent 113 Jensen. Moving into the architectural facade design, um, you know, very similar modern uh, context to this uh, facade and trying to, you know, with uh, be long-term in the foreseeable future and stand that test of time. Again, some distinct vertical elements uh, with the uh, ripple effect of the uh, blue and um, blue to white. We articulated that through breaking up the building forms um, and a distinct look, including the separated roof canopies with the cedar siding again underneath those and uh, providing the vertical breaks, like I mentioned with the um, mosaic, as, as you had stated earlier. The architectural design uh, of the building corner is in a prominent location and that's been identified as kind of a focal point and a landmark, which was um, why we sort of did that mosaic uh, pattern feature at the corner of the building. And the commercial elevations contain changes in the wall plane to provide a sense of scale while distinguishing it from the residential above. Um, this, the cladding is high life cycle and aesthetic quality. And again, um, same sort of colors and textures as you saw in Jensen and the same reasoning for those. Um, going a little faster because I know we have the context of time so I don't want to repeat myself, um, but same reasoning to choose those. And again, mechanical screening uh, has been considered and we've provided that in complement to the materials of the building to ensure you cannot see that from the street. The following next slide sort of uh, helps you visualize these features as well as the landscaping to, to provide that distinct uh, development from the pedestrian realm. So this first view is looking from Alberni to the east where you can see um, the commercial identified there on the main floor and residential above. Next slide is a view from 113, uh, oh, sorry, a view from the Jensen and Alberni looking uh, northeast. And this view is from uh, the kind of dedicated parking that we have provided on 113 Jensen looking to the west. And this last slide uh, is obviously the um, intersection of Jensen and Alberti. Um, and that focal point in that piece of that, uh, that we were trying to make like a bit of a landmark as you enter the city is a focal point. So that's that uh, mosaic pattern above the front, uh, front entrance. And I will uh, pass it over again to Will Pakolik, our uh, landscape architect who will walk you through the landscape. Sure, so I think a lot of the same principles were considered in this uh, as the previous presentation as Christina had alluded to. So I'm going to, um, really start on the west side of the site where we have quite a large pedestrian through zone and frontage zone. I think what I wanted to make sure that we were very clear on is that 
this coming into the urban core of the city that we had plenty of opportunities to provide a frontage zone where you can have patio sandwich boards on a smaller scale where it could serve within the private development those individual commercial retail units. Um, a consideration that we had was um, just north of the number three um, is that we had a raised planter against the building and then also to help break up the monotony of a constant staircase. We wanted to make sure we were providing handrails, um, but we wanted to consider that uh, it was fully accessible as well. So we provided for um, a 1.5 meter clear zone from the back of step uh, to the next planter and still have enough meaningful room for patio spaces um, and uh, different programmable functions. The next key consideration from our uh, point of view was that southwest corner where the most southwest number three is, um, is about the view from the intersection. We have that beautiful mosaic above. We've got the uh, planters in front of the uh, the corner on the public realm. We wanted to make sure that we maximize connectivity into the building and visibility and use that vegetation to help frame the architecture. Another key consideration for us was having full universal accessibility. Of course, the site is sloping quite a bit down as we head north. So our consideration was to make that connection from the intersection as closely as possible to those CRUs, um, utilizing a ramp where that number one is and sliding our way up to the north. Um, so it would be a single point of um, egress and uh, entrance uh, from the site at, from an accessible standpoint. Unfortunately, we are quite constrained on the site as Christina had alluded to, uh, and that was a key concession. Now, as we move along to the south, we are trying to preserve the integrity of the public realm to the greatest de degree possible. We're coming up uh, right to the property line with a zero lot line type of an architectural approach. We're trying to have that frontage zone be um, limited as little as possible. Um, we have bike parking right off of that, uh, the lane off of Jensen to make sure that any visitors are uh, being accommodated. We have bike parking up in the CRU areas as well. And as we move through the lane, um, what you see is residential units um, in the back, heavily screened, heavily vegetated. Uh, we recognize that this will be very much a service um, corridor. And so to that end, we wanted to make sure that the units on the east side of the building uh, were screened and felt that they were not just backing onto a parking lot and onto a laneway, but rather more of their own personal garden as a concession. Um, now, although it's not the most, um, I don't know, exciting development when you just talk about a parking lot, um, as a landscape architect, I find there are opportunities in this and what we were trying to implement is LID meaning low impact design uh, principles within this so what's not clearly articulated in the rendered plans and within our, our site is the fact that the curbs have constant curb cuts and the grading is such that we're intentionally overlanding all of our drainage into a bioswale that would then feed into a cistern below and would help um, irrigate the entire site so what we're trying to do is to um, future proof and make you know environmentally resilient sites. Um, and of course, the soil volume for a tree is a critical ingredient to have great, beautiful trees. So when you see a rendering with this great tree and they don't provide the right ingredients to make it get there, um, that is a common downfall. You plant a tree and you put small amount of soil, it gets to be about you know three meters wide and then it dies and you have to replace it and you're never uh, going to get the outcome you're going to want. So in this case, what we're doing is we're providing upwards of 15 cubic meters of soil per tree, which will give us those big lush canopies. So although it's a parking lot, we're going to have that, um, that screening in the summer uh, for the cars and create that visual appeal where we've got the foreground off Jensen of the boulevard trees, mid ground across that central planted median, and then the background. So it's visually breaking up the impact of the parking. We are screening it off of Jensen, but we're trying to create that layered effect throughout while integrating the LID stormwater catchment uh, and best practices from a green perspective. So I'll let uh, Eric slide the, move the slide forward and we can speak a little bit to the forming character. So I think one thing this section perspective really illustrates is that vertical change from the private to the public realm. And the consideration, what we have in mind is um, those raised planters, you'll see that um, kind of greenish tone that's on the nose of that planter right on the stairs. What that is, is kind of a leaning 
bench. So it's not meant to sit, it's meant to lean. So if one person goes into the store, um, their partner or whoever they're with could lean and wait, look on their phone while not impeding the through zone of the public realm, but it becomes still inviting, but not a place to necessarily stay long-term, but it is a comfortable place to wait. Again, you can see that uh, extruding planters up against the building facade to help articulate the individual units and help define where that frontage zone could be for patio spaces, sandwich boards, or ephemeral uh, urban treatments. Next slide. So this is just further down the way where we've got that planted edge. Again, the building facade, raised planters, accurate planters, trying to create a, a bit of a vertical interest. And go to the next slide. So again, I think this is a little bit of a redundant uh, section. I think we showed this um, elevation previously, but what we were trying to articulate in this section here is the fact that in fact, we are capturing the LID bed around the Molochs and at the far north side of the parking lot. Next slide. Again, so what we're, we're trying to highlight to you is that there is quite a great differential between the lane and the uh, building, uh, the residential units. And what we're trying to achieve with that is to have a very heavily vegetated um, side to the uh, public or to the, uh, to the private units and then have the lane through into our parking lot. Next slide. And uh, in the interest of time, I will pass it back to Christina. Thanks, Will. Uh, again, we conducted a shadow study um, for this project um, that was carried out again, winter, spring and summer, winter at the top, spring in the middle, as you can see and summer at the bottom. Um, we're not adjacent to any uh, uh, single family or residential home. So overall the impact um, on this uh, shading is, is quite minimal to the north. And that uh, sort of concludes our presentation and we'll, uh, Hopefully we have enough time for questions and input. I think we do. So let's, uh, <clears throat> let's do a quick round of questions. Uh, and if I can just ask one before my turn, is this one condominium or rental? It looks like condominium. Yeah, I, as of today, that's the uh, position we're proceeding with here. Okay, thanks. Ivan. <laughs> Yeah, my, my concern with this one with, and the accessibility issue again is with the steps and the walk to the parking. Uh, there's, there's no no way to access other than the steps or coming the long route round. So I, unless I'm missing something. I think there's level access at the south end. Is there the a site. level access? Yeah, the sidewalk is at the elevation of the the plaza at the south end, that's the accessible oh, okay. end. Okay. I still correct. have a little bit of concern coming across that to the parking. It's coming through a retaining wall, correct? The back. I think it's, um, it's that curved sidewalk at the uh, south end where you come off the city sidewalk you curve and you come right onto the plaza and then after that it's stairs so the accessibility I, i'm going to guess here is all at one end so you know obviously the high end of the site yeah that's correct the the grading the accessibility is all at that south end hmm. not sure i totally understand all the questions but no, I, I was seeking a clarification on the access to the parking. I think I've got it. I still have a little bit of concern coming down through that um, steps there. Maybe since, uh, you know, there's a uh, little bit of clarity required there. Can you just explain what I, I, I think I understand it, but you're, you're directing people to come from, you know, essentially the, the intersection at Jensen and Alberni where that curved sidewalk brings you onto the plaza. And that's your, your single uh, accessible access to that because of the amount of drop you've got going to the north. 
And I'm assuming that a ramp at the other end would be extremely long because of the amount of drop that you've got there. Yeah, that's correct. Um, essentially, for every step, you'd be looking more or less at a meter length of, uh, of ramp. So what we'd be looking at is uh, essentially between the two number fives on the north end, uh, that entire area would be ramp, switchback, and connection. So it would be an entirely a ramp, and it would, um, it would mitigate our permeability into the site. Um, although I think we're open to discussion on it, but we, we feel like we have provided the access on the south end. Um, but given the grading constraints, uh, we felt that this was the best trade-off to still provide access. Um, although it's not ideal, we'd love to work in a flat area where it's fully accessible. This was kind of the condition that we were kind of left with. So this was our best, uh, our best alternative that we identified. So perhaps if you were walking southbound on uh, coming from the other part of downtown and you uh, encountered these stairs, perhaps some, some minor signage indicating that uh, accessible access at south end of plaza would at least direct people who said, how am I going to get up here? Um, they know what to do. I, I think that's an absolutely fair comment. And I would, um, I would also identify that right um, between the number two and the number three at the so south end of the plaza, where that ramp comes in, if you were to follow the stairs south, it does terminate in a flat area. So the stairs aren't continuous all the way. There would be a flat uh, portion at the end of this, the south end of the stairs in addition to that uh, curving pathway. Okay. Did that answer it, Bob? Or? Yeah, I, I understand that. And I can see uh, the exit from the parkade and the crosswalk to get to the uh, the uh, refuse bins is also it's a little little bit of a walk for me at the moment. I would mm -hmm. find yeah. it difficult. Yeah. Yes, yes. Go ahead. As long as you're finished, Bob. Okay. <clears throat> Once again, I, I compliment you on your presentation. Um, I want to go through all the variances first. Here. First of all, the, the first one is the height. And um, I think that also presents some problems with knock on effect with the amount of parking that, that's available. Um, but we'll get to that. <clears throat> uh, reduce minimum setback for rare lot line from four meters to zero. I have no problem with that because that's technically a side yard, it's, uh, I think that one is fine. Um, again, the, the drive aisles, I'll leave that to, they knocked down on that one already. Um, minimum distance between off-street parking spaces and property line abutting a public highway. So I think, um, I have a problem with relaxing that. Um, no problem along the lane frontage, but I think when it comes to um, the, the building itself, um, along Jensen, the, the deepest setback would be, um, uh, sorry, wrong one here. Okay, so I think the setback along Jensen should not be relaxed. And along the lane frontage, it could, could go down to 1.6 meters. Along Jensen, the, the deeper setback should be more effective in hiding the, the vehicles while along the laneway, it, it's not that significant. Um, the next one is relax the requirement for a loading space from one space to zero. I, I, I think we need a loading bay. Uh, I'm opposed to uh, this variance because there's no adequate alternate space for deliveries without causing traffic chaos, which is just offloading your responsibility onto everyone else. The loading bay should somehow be incorporated off the lane. The intended purpose of the lane is to provide servicing to the building. 
uh, reduce minimum width for continuous landscaping, Jensen Avenue West, so from one and a half meters to 0.39, etc. cetera. Uh, this relaxation brings the building face very close to the sidewalk and street on Jensen. The, the landscaping strip besides softening the building's relationship to the street also allows the opportunity for some privacy to the unfortunate apartment right next to the entrance. It would also allow more space to improve traffic flow around the entrance and maybe some weather screening. Um, I, can, I can see the difficulty in landscaping along Alberni Highway, especially for planting shade trees because of the parkade below. Uh, but perhaps some large above ground planters with shade trees could create an interesting gathering place at street level. And there's still a lot of room for the stairs to the shops. Um, <clears throat> remove the requirement for uh, refuse removal areas to be screened on three sides. So, um, the, again, the location of this Moloch re, uh, refuse system, it's handy for a garbage pickup, but it's not so handy for the use of the occupants of the building that is serving. So, in principle, I have no objection to the lack of screening. Uh, again, I only question the viability of its location, uh, particularly for occupants with disabilities. Um, I also wonder about what happens to the garbage from businesses, There's cardboard boxes and other packaging, and how is that handled? And also, as I understand it, the bins are raised by crane for disposal. How would this work with the aspen trees that are to be planted right next to um, City of Parksville traffic bylaw number 1436 schedule A. So uh, uh, reduce the access separation from an adjoining parcel from 1.5 to zero. I can't see from the drawings exactly how the access ramp to the parkade works in terms of sight lines for emerging, emerging traffic, which I believe this particular bylaw was meant to address. So it's not really clear how that what, what you're asking for there and why. Um, so this building occupies a very significant corner. It is in fact the entrance to the downtown from the Alberni Highway. And as such, it portrays a significant message about the city, except for the height. This project is an improvement of the previous proposal for this site, but uh, still some issues to be addressed. So with the roofs, uh, I draw your attention to page 159, which states that sloped roofs should be used for mixed use commercial residential buildings. Uh, this being uh, the downtown DP area. Um, again, shed roofs that offer no shade or weather protection. Um, I find the, the entrance to the apartments very exposed to the southeast wind and rain. There's no way for vehicles to stop and drop off or pick up passengers. Again, I ask what about cabs, ambulances, FedEx, moving in or out, deliveries to the commercial units. Um, set down. Again, uh, the two large areas with diagonal cubist motifs uh, could be a good opportunity to showcase some indigenous art and emphasize Parksville's West Coast character. Um, and, you know, although the, uh, the, the, the colors the, are, the color palette for this building does not conform to the suggestions of the, of the OCP. Uh, I think because of the building you have across the street, they kind of tie together quite nicely. And so I would not be opposed to that. And um, again, I think uh, you've done a great job of the uh, water and energy conservation reduction of greenhouse gas proposals. Um, 
And as I said before, I like the technique of coloring the siding from dark at the bottom to light at the top. It makes the whole building feel so much lighter and softer. And overall, I think it's a good project, but I think there, there are a couple of parking uh, traffic related issues that need to be sorted out because uh, uh, all you're doing is offloading it onto the rest of the community. Okay, um, my turn. So I think it's a great looking building. Um, I like your mosaic uh, on the approach into the city. I, I would hate to lose that actually. I think that's a major uh, design element of your building and uh, I'm speaking personally here, but I quite like that. Um, I think the, the, the roof form comments are a carryover from the other building. Uh, so I, I'm sure we'll probably suggest that you look at those again. I wanted to emphasize that a, a lot of the things in our design guidelines say should, but they do not say shall. And uh, that does give some flexibility to, um, you know, to what I would call innovative and sharp new architecture, which is kind of what I see in this building. So I would not like force sloped roofs onto you for this building. And I appreciate your other argument that solar panels are on this building as well. So uh, I don't have a problem there. Um, I do kind of share the concern about loading because you have six commercial units here. And uh, I realize that most of them will be serviced by a vehicle much like a UPS or a FedEx truck, but uh, um, I'm not too sure. I also see the opportunity for, for that to happen. Um, those of us who live here know that Alberni Highway in that area is, can be pretty heavy with traffic and there's parking along there. Uh, you may, never, may not have a stall to pull into even when you have a delivery to be made. So maybe they'll double park, but um, I wouldn't mind hearing your rationale as to how you thought that might be accomplished for six commercial units. Um, overall, I think your, um, your landscaping is generous and really appreciated. Um, I like your water conservation techniques. I'm a big fan of swales collecting water the way you're doing that. And uh, we don't see that very often here. It's uh, something I've seen in lots of uh, lead projects in the past. And, uh, and so I, I like that a lot. And once again, I just like your overall color palette. It's refreshing. Um, it's not exactly in conformance with um, the recommended palette, but at the same time, I emphasize the, the should and shall part of that. And, uh, and I think it's important that this building tie to the one across the street because they're gonna be viewed as a pair. They really are. Um, I'm not sure I can think of, of anything else other than we, we quite often emphasize identification of the residential entrance, um, that it's obvious and clear that if you're visiting somebody who lives in, in here, that the entrance to the, uh, the residential area is clearly marked. And I think I can see something here about building signage. Um, whatever happens there, I, I appreciate that that's quite a defined setback area, but I think it should be made clear that's the building entrance. Uh, for, for residents, because uh, it is a little more complicated along the bottom than the other building, which is 100% residential. Uh, yeah, and I think that's pretty much all I have. Um, I like this, the building. I like the fact that you bent it the way that you did, and I like the fact that it puts a really nice face to traffic that comes into Parksville. That is so important, and we have nothing right now that is welcoming like this. So. Compliments, I guess, for that. Marilyn. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Oh, this is a great presentation again. Uh, and I, I have to agree with the panel's points. Um, I'll leave it to the um, professionals about the, the access, but I agree we do need access. It is very, very busy along Alberni Highway, and it would be difficult to stop. Um, I, I want to make a a, co a comment about the tree canopy in the parking. As a former dog owner, it was always difficult to park my car and go shopping for a few minutes and leave my dog in the car. So there's nothing like a tree canopy in a parking lot. That just is kudos to you. So, yep, the landscaping's great. Um, once again, you've, I, I think it's a welcome project. We cannot wait to see our downtown revitalized. And I appreciate 
all of your GHG initiatives again. Well done. Thank you. Um, I can uh, jump in here, I guess, and, and speak to uh, the loading and the rationale. I think, Tony, you had mentioned that. And we had looked at loading, um, and honestly, we had, when we were looking at it, we sort of prioritized parking over that. Um, but it is something that we can take away and look at. Again, we had incorporated it off the lane there in the back um, in order to uh, achieve that. When we, yeah, it's something definitely that we could look at, but we were really prioritizing parking at the time. Um, over the loading spaces, but uh, hear the comments and it's something definitely we can look at. Tony, can I ask a question? Do you mind? Uh, of the, um, I'm just wondering whether or not you've got some great perspectives you're showing, but not in our drawing package. And for council's sake, it would be very advantageous if some of those perspectives going along Alberni Highway if you could possibly um, provide those, it, they make a huge, huge difference. And you've, you've placed the, the drawings in context to Parksville, which is so, so helpful because it's, it's hard to imagine the, how the space will look when it's in space without, without the, so you've done a great job on that and it would be very helpful for us. Thank you. Yeah, that's no problem. I think the one that I can address, uh, the one question that jumped out to me was the variance on the um, side yard landscape setback of redu reduction down to 0.3, like essentially one foot of vegetation. So that is the right-hand side of this drawing uh, adjacent to that existing development, which is essentially a blank wall adjacent to a parking lot right now. Um, and so in the spirit of trying to achieve those widths um, throughout our uh, parking lot, the idea that we have on this, case here was this is what essentially is left. Um, we are looking to screen the side. We do have a chain link fence with a, uh, we will look at vines and different ways to help soften the, the chain link that's adjacent to the lot. Um, but there is, uh, in terms of connectivity and the interface with the adjacencies, there's not, not too many opportunities that are left to us uh, as to how to interact with this building that's directly to our east. Uh, so that's why we're, we're proposing that 0.3 of a setback. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to speak to the traffic bylaw, the Schedule A variants that we're, uh, we're requesting um, for Park 8 entrance and the proximity to the north property line. Um, again, this is a direct result of the great complexities that we've faced on, uh, on this project. Um, incorporating the Park 8 entrance at the, at the, the far end of the site or, or, the ninth, or the north end of the site where the grade fall is at the greatest provides the least amount of ramp slope into the parkade, which it just provides the most functional use of the parkade. It also maximizes the space, the usable parking space within the parkade. I just wanted to make sure that that rationale was captured. I think the one other comment that I got about the cardboard for the businesses, those Mollocks, um, you know, they go do go into the earth, so they have quite a big capacity. Um, you have to break things down to get them through in. And, and I think though that's just being responsible, breaking down your cardboard. So I, there'll be no um, issues with the commercial having to use those for um, their needs. Yeah, and I, I could just elaborate, elaborate a little bit more on the Molox as well. Um, there was a question about the tree canopies relative to the craning system. Um, so the Molox number one, they do come in, it's not just waste exclusively, there is the opportunity for waste recycling um, and composting uh, that Molox does come with. And we're making sure that uh, the tenants uh, from the CRUs are going to have the, their needs met as well as the residents of the building. Um, regarding the, the crane operations, 
So the trembling aspen that we're proposing here is generally speaking, you know, reasonably high headed. And although what you're seeing here is a very large diameter circle, it is more umbrella in shape rather than just kind of a lollipop. So the clearance of lifting that uh, the crane, we should have that uh, fairly well accommodated. Um, and again, because our, our internal team would be maintaining this, um, structural pruning would make sure that that's clear and we would not have an obstruction to the waste uh, receptacle uh, operations. Thank you. Um, just a quick explanation for you. His, his rationale for the entry ramp for the parkade is that the building is already five or six feet out of the ground at that point. So the ramp into the parkade is quite low sloped and it's uh, efficient in terms of ramp length and, uh, and a gentle access into the parkade, basically. Uh, yes, that's uh, correct. Yeah. Okay, we are sort of getting to the end of our time here. So uh, I think we need some recommendations and I think we can start with the, uh, the loading bay consideration would be number one. These are the ones I know for sure, we'll, we'll continue. Uh, number two, I think we would reflect the same comment we made across the street about the roof uh, forms. Uh, just not a specific recommendation, just a request to, to consider those. I think it says, again, it says should, it doesn't say they can't. So, uh, you know, as I say, I don't think those were meant to defeat architectural design. Um, you know, they were, they're, they're also, you know, a reasonably, in my opinion, a reasonably old recommendation that reflects a kind of architecture that existed around here about 20 years ago. And I see numerous examples of buildings, whether they've been through this design panel or not, that, that don't have sloped roofs. So, um, you know, a good example, uh, you know, there's a nominal slope put on some of them, and I don't know if that was just to, uh, to get nominal conformance, but. Uh, yeah. And if they said must or shall, I would agree with you, but the language is there, so. The loading dock, the, the roof forms, I would just suggest that if it applied across the street, the same suggestion should be made to this one. Can we get them to provide more weather protection, et cetera? But we also know they're working with solar panels here. So um, can, can you give me more things that I need to put into the recommendations? We can comment on them if we disagree with them, but we're not the decision makers, so. Yeah, that one I think is, uh, I think just as residents here, we know that that's a problem. Uh, and uh, height is, is allowed for this kind of building to this height, I believe, isn't it? Can you wanna show me where it isn't? Yeah, so this one is zone C3, similar mm -hmm. to the first project that we saw today. Um, they have applied for a separate development variance permit to consider the height to allow for that fourth store, story, sorry, um, as well as the rear lot line step back from four meters down to zero. Um, Bob, you know. Right. like you're okay with it. I am too.
Mm -hmm. I think we agree on the loading base, so I don't know that we have to go any further on that one. Yeah. Is there anything else on this building that we need to uh, address uh, specifically? So roof form is, is, a, is a revisit for them. The loading dock is a, an item that we want to see for this area. Or, um, You mean this one? Yeah, well, I would disagree with that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a major architectural feature. I could see indigenous art, again, there's a bit of a, a plaza area in the front and perhaps a, uh, an item of indigenous art could be incorporated into that little plaza area. But um, Bob, what do you think of that? Uh, I'm not really artsy, but this, this looks good to me, okay, from an engineering point of view. So why don't we make a suggestion that that's some in, indigenous art be incorporated to basically reflect the, the use of it across the street, but not specific to that panel, because I think two of us don't agree with replacing that panel. I think your point about incorporating it into the site, I think there's definitely opportunities. Um, right now, the way that we've approached it was to be very flexible um, for uh, ephemeral urban design. So to respond to if there was a special event, um, this space is very much a, a blank canvas ready to be painted by the citizens of Parksville, as opposed to us prescribing a specific use. So I think your point is well taken that we can look for opportunities within the site itself. So these sound like the other building and that they're just individual points. Uh, I don't know if the loading dock maybe uh, is, is governed in, in development area three. So I don't think so. I think we're gonna have to put that as an individual. Yeah, so the, the loading space um, is regulated through the um, development, or sorry, the zoning bylaw. Okay. Um, so typically loading spaces are required for every 2,000 square meters of commercial area. Um, this particular building, they've proposed to have roughly 500 square meters of commercial. Um, we have varied or eliminated loading spaces in the past downtown, but each site's unique. So you want to have them take another look at that? That yeah. is something that we could direct them to. I think we could argue this one is unique because of the traffic in front of it. Uh, um, so I think all three of us have agreed that that would be a, a good place to look. And there does seem to be an opportunity or two to incorporate it, so. Just that we would like them to examine possibilities for a, a loading area for this building. I think this one is unique, you know, in its requirements to have it. Whereas I know in other places we've said no because it really seemed unnecessary. Here it's a little different. Um, yeah, so in, I would say this is the same recommendation as the one across the street. DP with variance, request for additional information. you agree, would somebody move and somebody second? <laughs> Moved by Ivan, seconded by Bob. <laughs> Great, um, so we just need a mover and a seconder to end the meeting. Yes, could someone move that we end the meeting? That would be Ivan, seconded by Bob. Thanks for your presentation. Um, very thorough, appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. We, we appreciate it and your feedback. Okay. Bye Thank now. You. Bye, everybody.
five to one, we split it. <laughs> and it's five to one, so we'll be 